Hi, welcome to the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast. This is going to be a weekly show dedicated to talking all things Port Adelaide. Um, you're here with your host, I am Enviable Tradition. Uh, we've got here with us Fishing Rick 04. Do you want to say good day, Rick? Yeah, how you going, mate? And we've got Macca 19 as well. G'day, guys. How you going? So we thought just to kick this off, we'd, we'd sort of give everyone a bit of an introduction to us and who we are and why we're here talking about the Port Adelaide Football Club that we love so much. So, uh, Rick, I thought I might start with you. Do you want to uh, fill us in on how you became a Port Man? All right, I became a uh, Port Man from a non-football background. My parents came from Europe, and uh, but my father sort of inherited uh, the Norwood Football Club as, as his footy team. So uh, being a rebellious teenager, <laughs> about... 1984, I decided to follow the complete opposite and went for Port Adelaide. And, and as we know, that year didn't end up working out too well, but I just fell in, the love, in love with the club back in 84 after that uh, infamous grand final and uh, followed the club through to watch all the success from 88 onwards until now. Fantastic. And so, uh, Rick, are you, do you follow both teams now, your Maggies and the Power, or...? Oh, look, primarily uh, uh, the AFL, uh, yep. Port Adelaide Power, uh, but I still uh, I still uh, loosely follow the Magpies as well. I mean, you know, it's all part of the one club. I've got maybe a bit of a controversial view on it, but everyone looks at it <laughs> a bit differently. Well, I'm sure we'll get into that at a later date, so we'll save that one up for a bit later. And, uh, and so, yeah, Maka, how did you get into the Port Adelaide Footy Club? Oh, pretty much just through family. Um, family's been involved at the club in one way or another. Um, oh, probably since about the 40s, um, where the sort of training, um, I've had uh, sort of cousins go through the grades there. Um, my great-grandma used to board country players. Uh, she used to live literally about 25 metres from the, the southern goals at Albert and Oval. Um, so pretty much through family. i uh, been a member um, for as long as I can remember. Um, started going to the football uh, when I was young, around about 1988. I guess it was a pretty good time to start. Um, so yeah, pretty much that's about it really. Yeah, beautiful. And, uh, yeah, and I'm very much the same. It was very much through my family. My dad comes from across in the West Coast in one of our, uh, traditional recruiting zones across in Sejuna there. And, uh, so, you know, I grew up a port man, obviously he was from, uh, Thevenard, which is the magpies over there as well. So he, he came over and decided to be a port man when he got to Adelaide. Um, so I think I went to my first premiership, my first port premiership when I was actually about six months old. Um, and uh, and I've been going to port games ever since I can remember, still going to the games with my dad. Um, so very much a big part of my life, predominantly nowadays uh, following the power. But I do get to usually at least a couple of Maggie's games a year, certainly listen to a few more than that on the radio as well. Um, so, so still sort of try and keep in touch and try and keep following both clubs as well. So um, I guess that's, uh, that's an introduction to us and who we are. Um, let's get into talking about the Port Adelaide Football Club. All right, so now we're going to move on to the next segment of our show, which is our love-hate for the week. Uh, so each week we're going to give you one thing that we've loved, one thing that we've hated uh, that's been going on in and around the Port Adelaide Football Club over the last week. So uh, perhaps, Rick, we might start with you. What, what's been your love and your hate for the week? Oh, well, my love for this week was um, a little uh, Sammy Calhoun at uh, Central District. So I just think uh, for a young fella who everyone says is still undersized, um, stepping up to uh, SANFL seniors and, and racking up consistent disposals every week in the SANFL when there's been a lot of other experienced players that have been down there for a lot longer and many more years have, uh, you know, struggled to rack up the numbers that he's had. And I reckon, you know, I think he's got a bright future ahead of him once he gets a bit more body and, and shape onto him and he's going to be forcing his way into the Port Adelaide back lines. And my hate this week is the whole SANFL and the Port Adelaide Reserve debacle. Um, you know, not only is it a farce that we uh, can't get some agreement here when, you know, there's 16 other teams in different states that can, but not only that, it just sort of hurts the brand for, for Port Adelaide, which if we've had issues with in the past, and it also just hurts the brand of SANFL football. And, uh, you know, it just it's just really farcical that we can't really sort something out. 
<laughs> I'm sure you're not the only one that's got that yeah. as their hate this week, Greg. So I'm sure I'm sure you're not alone there. Uh, so, Matthew, what was your love and your hate for the week? My love's uh, Matthew Loby, the big lobster. Um, I think people would know uh, from what I've typed on the boards over the last few years that I haven't really been a big fan of Matty Loby um, and his ruck work. Um, I thought he is. He was heading to be sort of more of a negative ruckman in, in the fact that he jumps early, um, puts off the other ruckman um, without actually sort of winning the, the hit outs himself. Uh, but now that he's got a, a, a big chance um, in the side as the, the first ruckman with red and out, um, I think he's taken it with both hands. His last four or five weeks have been, you know, just really fantastic. He's winning a lot of hit outs. Um, the only thing he probably needs to improve on is, is, uh, is probably his marking. Um, he's not taking a lot of marks. Um, if he can do that, well, I think he'll turn into a really fantastic ruckman for the future. Um, my hate, I think it's probably a bit... Um, I think a lot of people will have the same. Uh, the cane corn suspension, mm. just absolutely farcical that you can get two weeks of pushing someone in the back. Not even all that hard. There, there was no striking. It was a push in the back. Um, I don't know what Mark Fraser's on. Um, I mean, he used to play the game pretty soft, you know, running down the wing about 20 metres on his own. So I don't, maybe he's trying to turn the AFL into that sort of style of footy. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I hated it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you won't have any. I think you have plenty of friends there on that one as well, Maka. I think you guys have picked two pretty popular hates there for this week. So, um, look, I'm, my, my love for this week, and some people will probably think this is a bit of a uh, an unport Adelaide love, but... I actually just love the fact that the team wasn't blown away by the Hawks. Like I thought at various stages throughout the game, the Hawks played some pretty exceptional football. Their 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 skill level, their disposal, the way they you know pass the ball up the ground was just exceptional at times. And and I thought that even though we got beaten, you know, I wasn't sitting there thinking, oh my god, this is you know we're just getting absolutely smashed. I wasn't sitting there th- wondering whether there was any hope for us to get better. You know, it was it, there was actually signs there of improvement that we're not the same team that we have been over the last few years. So I thought even though we got beaten and probably beaten reasonably convincingly, I thought there were signs there that we've certainly improved and are and are moving in the right direction. So that was probably the the pleasing thing for me, I guess, from the weekend. The the thing I didn't like, the hate for me for the week was really the disposals, the, particularly the panicky handballs. I mean, we were just, uh, you know, they put us under the pump. And, and this week, as opposed to perhaps some of the other weeks, we didn't respond well to that. Um, and so, uh, you know, as much as that'll be a really good learning process for the team and that's going to help them get better in future weeks, uh, it wasn't great to watch this week when they were really sort of panicking with the ball in hand. So uh, that was certainly something I didn't like this week and something I'm hoping we're going to be uh, seeing less and less of as time goes on and is, as this team gets a bit more experience. So, um, you know, I guess moving from that then, that moves pretty naturally onto the, uh, the game versus the Hawks on the weekend. Um, perhaps, Rick, you might like to start again on, uh, on what your thoughts were of that particular game. Oh, look, we're always uh, going to be battling, you know, clearly the best side in the competition and, you know, we've uh, we've struggled with them for the last couple of years. So I sort of sort of agree with what you're saying. You know, we, we, stood, we fought it out reasonably hard and we, we tried and competitive and they've got big bodies. I mean, Jared Roughhead showed what a big body can do and how it can influence the game and, you know, they bring the most, um, the physical aspect to the game, don't they, in relation to their niggling and, I mean, even Kane Corns, um, you know, when he pushed over uh, Mitchell, you, you saw what he received afterwards. I'm surprised there wasn't a few more reports after uh, what happened with Kane. And, uh, you know, and the boys are learning. And really, what, we've had three big losses so far this season. And, uh, you know, one's been from the top team. The other one's been from the second to top team. And the other one's been from the team that's sitting in, uh, what, sixth position. So, you know, we're getting there and the young boys are, are learning. And, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's a bit controversial for Port supporters to say... Uh, you know, we don't accept losing or we don't like losing, but I guess we've got to be realistic. We've got a lot of young boys and, um, you know, and they're learning. Uh, the one, I guess one of the noticeables for me, I don't know if you guys noticed, I guess Chad Wingard's still got his 22 stats, but I, I probably didn't notice them as much this week as I have to, uh, to previous weeks. Yeah, it was a little bit sloppy this week, I thought. Uh, still played well, though. Oh, of course. I mean, what twenty-two posies, one goal. He's he's on his uh, he's on his season average there. But uh, yeah, I mean, Hawthorne did well. They obviously negated his influence a, a little bit more. And uh, you know, it's an experienced side. And uh, I think you know the boys look like they're learning from playing the experienced sides. Whereas 
you know, in previous seasons, we just looked like we were just completely out of our depth against experienced sides, and there, there wasn't much progress. So I think there's, I think there's a lot to take away from the game, and uh, you know, and uh, we'll just have to uh, battle on, and let's see how we go. And what were your thoughts of the game, Maker? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree. I thought we played pretty well. Um, there were periods of game where we. We did probably struggle to move the ball out of the defensive 50 with the, the endless sort of handball strings. Um, it sort of brought back some bad memories of the, the latter-day Choco era, uh, but thankfully they're gone now. Um, I thought we played pretty well. Um, you know, we, we did take it up to Hawthorne. Uh, we didn't get blown away. Um, we gave it all we got. Um, if we were a bit cleaner with the ball, um, maybe structurally we, we could have done with an extra... You know, we re- really could have done with Westhoff out there um, and maybe another, I think in hindsight, another key defender. Um, Homsch would have been pretty handy given that Gunston and Ruffhead both kicked five goals. Um, the thing that I think we need to keep in mind is that Hawthorne, are, you know, they are gunning for a premiership pretty hard this year. It could well be their last chance um, with this current group. Um, they've got something like 800 games more experience than what we've got. I think the average age of their, their squad on the weekend was three years older than ours. And, and that's quite significant. Um, you know, they're a, a very match-hard and ready-to-go team. We're still learning. Um, I thought we did pretty well. Yeah, and, and I've probably already given my thoughts a little bit on this game, but but I thought the same. Like, I, I thought Hawthorne just showed us what it takes to be the you know the best team in the competition I thought they you know they really did play some exceptional football the the way they transitioned the ball from defense to attack you know at times they just absolutely split us open with just precision kicking and precision mm. disposal um was you know it was pretty awesome to watch at times and and you look at that and you think you know you know we've still got a little way to go uh, but as I said having said that you could really see um you know the development in the young players you could see that you know, we're heading on the right track. We've, we've got the right players there. As you said, they are learning. Um, you know, I think we've got the right game plan there. I, I think definitely, as you said, the, the couple of extra tools would have been very handy. I mean, Westhoff was a big out for us. His ability just to plug gaps, you know, forward and back uh, can make a massive difference for us. Um, and, yeah, probably that extra key defender or that extra tall at the back line to, to be able to drop in and, you know, chop off in front of Ruffy and, and cut off some of those attacks would have probably made a big difference to us as well. Um, I think it's probably been, in, you know, we might talk about this another time, but it's probably been an interesting aspect of Hinckley's coaching is that he has at times seemed to go in a little bit shorter and, and really back in some of those mid-range guys to, to do that job. Um, I'm not sure whether that's, you know, whether he has a belief around that that we don't need those taller guys or whether he's just wanting those taller guys to really prove that they deserve a spot and force their way into the team. I think that'll be really interesting to see as we go forward. Um, but, but I think, you know, as a general rule, rule I think the guys did pretty well. Um, and I think the key is going to be now how they respond to that next week and, and whether we can back that up versus St Kilda and show that, you know, that, that whilst we didn't uh, perhaps play our absolute best, that we played reasonably well against the top team and now we need to replicate that sort of performance to, to make sure we can get over the line against St Kilda, which I think is pretty important. So Absolutely. Um, perhaps, perhaps we can move on from that and move into our best players. Rick, who were your best players on the day? Oh, well, I thought, uh, you know, Travis Boak, uh, you know, stood up well and uh, responded from last week, really. He, um, he, uh, you know, there was a bit of criticism, I guess, that he had a low possession count the week before. And, uh, you know, I think someone was saying that they thought that he might have been carrying an industry, uh, industry an injury, but uh, he really stood up, uh, I thought, with 31 possessions and, and really tried hard. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Brad Ebert, I think, he tried hard again as well. I think, you know, someone, some other people were questioning his disposal, but, I mean, just his gut running, you just can't question it, really. He's just up there every week, and uh, he's a bit of a uh, bit of an animal when it comes on the footy field and his running ability. And, uh, and Maka, who do you like on the weekend? Yeah, I thought our best player was probably uh, Robbie Gray. Um, only kicked the one goal, but he had four goal assists. Uh, especially in that first half, he was electric in that forward 50. Uh, really helped to set up the play. Um, I agree that uh, that Boak played pretty well. Had a bit of a, a dodgy third quarter, but you know the other three quarters he played really well. Um, I've already talked about Matty Lobie. I thought he had a really good game in the ruck. Um, Angus Monfries, um, what a pickup! Um, you know, I'd, I think a lot of people were a bit unsure about how he would play, 
this year, but you know he's moved a bit more into the midfield. He's getting a lot of the ball more than he's he ever did at Essendon. He's still kicking goals. You know, he played really well. Um, obviously, Kane Corn's job on Sam Mitchell. I thought he, he took him out of the game pretty well. Um, and Chatty Wingo, um, you know, 22 touches and a goal. He just keeps on keeping on. Yeah, and uh, you know, I thought actually my best was someone you guys haven't even mentioned actually, which I thought Ebert played a great game on the weekend. I I just love watching Ebert play the. The gut running that he does to, to get into space and to spread and to create an option for his teammates is just exceptional sometimes. Like you see him just sprint, you know, huge chunks of the field at a time just to make an option and to, to create that link up play. I think, you know, he's been fantastic for us since coming back and it's great to see a good port boy there doing so well. Yeah, I've, um, I've got and a my, lot my, of uh, I've got a lot of man love for Ebert. I reckon he's a fantastic footballer. <laughs> and ever yeah. ever since he took over the captaincy, I think it was against Collingwood. His yeah. last three weeks have just been phenomenal. Um, yeah, and, he's know, just busting it out if there. He, if he can do that over a whole season, there's no doubt he's an all-Australian quality player. Yeah, and, and as I said, it's it's often the unrewarded running and the gut running he does for the team, which I really appreciate. And and so my next best was Boke. I thought he had a, a really good day. You know, as you said, perhaps not as effective or as you know clean as he perhaps has been other times. But you know, to, to rack up 31 posies against one of the best teams and one of the best midfields in the competition, I thought he did a pretty darn good job. So, so I was pretty happy with that. Um, what about the young guys? Has anyone who caught your eye from the young guys, Rick? Oh well, how can you go past uh, Chad Wingard? Really, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, as Mac has said, you know, 22 possessions once again and and a goal. He's just, uh, you know, and he's just he's going to be one of those guys that just brings people to the game, isn't he? You know, he's yeah. just he's just exciting to watch, and he's got that X factor, and you know, he can run up the ground and play as an inside mid, and then he, you, next minute you're seeing him on the outside, and uh, and he's collecting the outside ball, and he just never, you know, hardly ever burns the ball. He's always doing something well with it. And uh, you know, I noticed someone on the on the forums today was mentioning that, uh, you know, he was he was vomiting, and and then someone else said, you know, it's quite often to see Chad running that hard and busting the gut that he's uh, vomiting on the sidelines, and you know, just running that hard and. Yeah, he's just, you know, he's, he should be an inspiration to all the young boys and even the senior boys, just with the work ethic. Yeah. And, uh, and Macker, I have a feeling who you, I have a feeling, I know who you're going to say out of the young guys, but uh, but who do you like on the weekend? I'm going to say Andrew Moore. Oh, there you go. I was sure you were going to say Lobby. Lobby, <laughs> no, Andrew Moore. Andrew Moore, yeah. he's another similar like Lobby. <laughs> I was not at all convinced about um, going back sort of at the start of the year. Um, a lot of people were up in arms that he got dropped. Uh, I think it was after the Carlton game or maybe the one after that. Um, mm. Something that Hinkley yep. said a few a couple of weeks ago um, at the aftermatch presser with Hamish Hartley, he said, if your midfielders don't chase, then they don't get a game. And I mm. reckon Andrew Moore was, that was directed pretty much at Andrew Moore. Ever since he's come back into the side after being dropped, he's just been fantastic. A, a whole new player. His ability to get the quick kick um, from a stoppage is something we haven't had since sort of Roger James and Josh Carr since they were running around. Um, and if, again, if he continues to develop like this, he will be a, a, a really good, really strong footballer for a number of years for us. Yeah, yeah, I love that one. Mm. And, and that quote from Hinkley is probably my favourite quote of the whole year, actually. Like Absolutely. when I heard him say that, and they asked him that question, and he said, mm. well, it's pretty simple. You know, if they don't defend, I don't pick them. And I thought, that's just, that's what we need. That's fantastic. Yeah. So um, you actually stole my thunder there, Maka, because I was going <laughs> to pick more as my young gun as well. And, uh, <laughs> you know, mine is probably just as much out of stubbornness as anything else. Like I sort of, I've liked more really right from the start. I've, I've always thought he's just had something there as a real inside midfielder, you know, someone who can really get that first hand on the ball and get the ball going our way with a, you know, a big, strong body. And I, I think he's going to be a great player for us. He's probably, you know, come on a little bit slower than, than some of us would have liked, but you know, some of them just do take longer, and he, he's not a little boy. He's, he's a big unit, and uh, and sometimes those guys can take a little bit longer. Uh, but but I think he's going to be a really good player for us. I think he's going to be a very good player for us, actually. I think, you know, having someone like that in the middle, a bit like Ollie Wines, these big bodies who can get that first hand on the ball, who can bullock their way through. And, uh, and you know, not everyone is an Ollie Wines. Not everyone can come in and do that right from the first uh, from the first game. So uh, I think Maury is going to be something really special for us. So I'm, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned him, Maka, because I support you 100% there. Beauty. Shake out the thunder from the sky. 
So, uh, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to move on to doing a bit of a review of uh, our team in the SNFL. So we're going to have uh, Mac is going to give us a quick wrap up here of the Port Adelaide Magpies and how they went on the weekend. Thanks, mate. Um, Port played Sturt round 15. They played on Sunday at Unley Oval. Um, unfortunately, it was a loss. Uh, Sturt ended up winning by 22 points. They scored 13 goals, 9.87 uh, to Port Adelaide's 10 goals, 5.65. Um, best players were probably uh, Zaney Kirkwood. Um, he's been around for probably about four or five years now um, and has really developed into a very strong SANFL footballer, uh, playing a little bit behind the ball. He picked up 31 disposals and 11 marks. Uh, Corey Baird, he's, um, he's, I think he's done four pre-seasons with the power. Um, has been pretty unlucky not to be picked up. He got moved forward halfway through the game, ended up with 23 disposals, 13 marks and a goal. Um, Sam Gray, he's probably Port Adelaide's most consistent footballer in the SANFL. He had another 20 disposals. Um, and then two power boys, they were, they were pretty good as well. Uh, Brendan Archie, he's, he's played the last... I think seven or eight games at uh, at league level. Um, he picked up 19 disposals. Um, it was probably his best game of football. And um, Benny Newton as well. He's someone that's um, that's really developed, especially in confidence this year as it's gone on. He picked up 18 disposals as well. Um, it wasn't a great start uh, to the match. Uh, Sturt kicked four goals, three to a behind um, in the first quarter. Um, Port hit back well with the wind in the second quarter. Um, as I mentioned, Corey Beard uh, moved forward. John Cock kicked a couple of goals. I think we scored, I think, five goals in about eight minutes of footy um, and really came at Sturt pretty hard. Um, but from then on, Sturt really took control of the game. Um, they ended up winning by 22 points. It wasn't that big a margin. Um, but for them, um, guys like Greenslade, um, Sam Kerridge, he had 29 disposals and a goal. Um, yeah, Richie Tambling played okay. Ben Kane as well. They've got a, I don't know. They've got a, a pretty well experienced side. Sturt. I'm not sure why they don't perform better than they do. Um, in terms of the Magpies, I think improvement needs to come from the key position players, especially key forwards. We really lack um, a couple of real tall targets to just to hoof the ball to. Uh, we rely too much on Graham Johncock. I think. Um, I think guys like Corey Grove and Ben Harron probably need to stand up. Um, and really make a league spot their own. Um, we play North Adelaide this week. And I think it's the ABC game as well. I'd recommend getting out to Prospect and, and giving it a go. I think people are going to uh, be at the ground uh, with a petition to stop the AFL in SANFL <laughs> shenanigans. Um, I recommend not signing that if, if you end up going to the game personally. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure there'll be plenty of Port fans agreeing with you there, mate. So, um, Rick, perhaps we'll move on a little bit and start having a look at some of the other power players in the uh, playing in the SNFL at the moment. Is, uh, you know, obviously, uh, maybe not have got to all those games, but has anyone caught your eye just from you know the reports we've been getting? Yeah, well, I thought uh, I thought it was a not- noticeable mention. You know, first year recruit uh, uh, Mason Shaw. Uh, I think he's held his spot well, and I noticed. It's been mentioned on the on the forum a few times by people as well. Quite happy, everyone's. He went up, and I think a lot of people were expecting him to uh, to go back down after a game with the the more noticeable names and uh, coming back uh, for them. But uh, he's held his spot, and I think that's uh, promising for Porter. Uh, you know, there's been a bit a few raps on him as a player, and uh, I think that's uh, quite exciting for us. And hopefully uh, next year he can progress further and. Uh, um, I also noticed um, Brendan Archie for Port. Uh, he increased his possession account, uh, count again from uh, from previous games, and uh, you know I know speaking to Brendan that that's something he's trying to focus on, and you know it's good to see him doing that. And I think the other one, you know, sort of the enigma for everybody has been uh, Benny Newton. You know I think he's now starting to show some uh, consistency at. Uh, at SANFL level, and he, obviously he's starting to overcome those injury concerns that he that he had uh, from when he was recruited, and uh, you know it's good to see him uh, putting that together. And you know, hopefully these boys uh, 
uh, can get a, you know, they're all young, can still get another opportunity and get, get more contracts and show us uh, what they can deliver. And obviously, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, young young Hoon uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the show uh, in relation to his output at SANFL. So, uh, you know, there's no surprise to, to see him racking up the uh, possessions once again. Yeah, and I'm probably most excited, I think, about that tall timber coming through. I mean, Mason Shaw, as he said, you know, if he can uh, can really come good as we're hoping he will, he's, he's going to provide a real uh, extra dynamic to our attack and, and to our team in general, perhaps even as that ruck forward he's playing as for South now, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then you look at the defenders where you've got, uh, you know, Tom Cleary, I think I'm saying that right, he's doing really well there for a first-year player, seems to be coming along in absolute leaps and bounds. Um, and Jack Comps, obviously, you know, probably pretty unlucky to be out of the team at the minute. Um, but doing a really good job there, unfortunately, against the Magpies for Sturt. Uh, but it's pretty exciting to see some of that real quality tall timber actually performing at SNFL level and, and hopefully, you know, being really young guys, you know, in the next couple of years, really pushing forward for some league spots with the power as well. So, um, Maka, what have you liked to look of in the reserves? Yeah, definitely Tom Cleary as well. Um, I don't know, for, for a, a young kid to come in, to Glenelg's league side and perform as well as he has as yeah. a key defender is just fantastic. I mean, we haven't had that for a long time. Um, mm. I think it shows great signs for the future, um, especially on the weekend. I think he was named second best for Glenelg um, in a team that got beaten by about 90 points. Um, I think that shows great signs. Um, Campbell Heath as well. I'm, I'm shocked he, he got dropped. I thought his first five weeks were as good as anybody. Um, I love his uh, his attack, his confidence, um, especially his courage as well. He's, he's sort of like Cam O'Shea. He's not afraid to sort of step in front of a of oncoming traffic and and cop the hit. And I look forward to him getting back in into the team pretty soon. Okay, so now I guess we can move on to what's been one of the biggest issues in regards to the SNFL at the moment, and that's been the SNFL reserves issue. Uh, Rick, you mentioned off the top of the call that you had um, perhaps a bit of a controversial view on this one, so perhaps you'd be the best person to start us off. What, do, what are your thoughts on this, mate? <laughs> <laughs> on the SNFL reserves, it's, uh, oh, mate, where do we go and uh, how long is this podcast going for? Um, look, it's just... Um, I don't know. It's just, it's hard. I can, on one hand, I can understand the SANFL purists um, who've supported it all their lives, like generations, and and you know they don't want to compromise their uh, their competition. And and at the same time, I can I can see where as a club we want it for development, and you know obviously it's a model that's successful. And I mean before we. We were in the AFL. We had our league team in the reserves, and so did everybody else. And you know, it, we need to have our our own reserves and our own base. And, and you know, and I mean, the SANFL's compromised with AFL players playing in it anyway. So, I mean, what are what are we doing here, really? I mean, you know, maybe the SANFL uh, clubs need to come out and say, look, we don't we don't want any AFL players in our rosters at all anymore. I mean, basically that's what they're almost going to say. And and the other farce for me at this point in time, and it really makes me angry, is now what, because, because the Crows don't have under-16s and under-18s and they don't have uh, have zones, uh, what, now Port Adelaide have to lose all their invo- involvement, even though, you know, we were agreed that we could operate as one club. What, so now we can't do that anymore. We can't be one club. We can't have our his, historical zones, or we can't have, um, you know, our right to the the junior comps, and you know. And so it, it's one hand we're giving, and one hand we're taking. But it seems to be a lot more taking, and and a lot more giving. And you know, everyone seems to be talking to people, and and everyone that's talking is saying, you know, there's there's still deep seated wounds. And I mean, Graham Corns even uh, wrote an article last week, sort of agreeing with our structure and and saying that, um, you know. People need to move on, and uh, maybe maybe everyone needs to move on. And uh, you know, <laughs> hopefully, uh, in the next century, uh, that can actually happen. But uh, all I'd like to see is uh, a unified approach to some model. And you know, and I don't really care what the Crows do. I just I care what happens to Port Adelaide. And uh, you know, and you know, the clubs come out, and we've made our stance. And you know, we've just got to follow that through. Yeah, and what are your thoughts on this issue, Maker? It's obviously a pretty hot topic at the moment. 
I just don't understand why both Port Adelaide and Adelaide have to be equitable in this situation. Like, we are different football clubs. You know, Port has been around for 145 years, whatever it is. Well, I just don't understand why they have to be exactly the same. Um, we've got that junior system in place. To lose that, I think, would be an absolute disaster. I think, I don't know, there's, there's a few people on our board who have sort of said, well, who cares? I mean, these are relationships um, that have been built and, you know, developed over, you know, a century, basically. Mm. Um, to lose that would be a disaster. Um, I mean, there's, I don't know, 5,000 Port Magpies members. How will they feel, um, you know, if, if we lose our junior system? Um, and we need to think, you know, how many people involved in those junior systems are Port Adelaide members as well, um, who will stop following Port Adelaide, who will stop being a member. Um, I mean, it could well split the club in two. Um, that's basically where I'm at. Um, I think we do need a reserves team. I think it should be in the VFL reserves, um, or the VFL, sorry. Um, I think we should leave the SANFL completely. Um, if that means that we need to possibly split um, and let the Port Adelaide Magpies go their separate way um, to run their own football club, I think that could possibly be on the cards um, because I think it would be a, a bit of a disaster if we do lose our zones and our junior system. Yeah, I, I've got to be honest. I, I think it'd be a bit of a disaster to split the clubs again. I think the identity crisis we've gone through over the last, you know, five to ten years, um, really, really hurt us in terms of our brand, in terms of us being able to sell what the Port Adelaide Football Club is to both members and to corporates and to, and to media and, and everyone really. So, you know, I'd really like to see the clubs stay together. You know, I think. Um, you know, I, I could understand if the SNFL said, look, we don't want anything to do with AFL at all. We want to get all the AFL players out of the SNFL and we'll just have a pure footballing league. You know, if they said that, in many ways I could understand that. I, I think they don't understand perhaps how much that would actually hurt them as a league. That, that if that attention went away from the SNFL and all of a sudden the, the AFL reserves was the second best league in the, competi- in the, in the country, then, uh, then I think that that would really hurt the SNFL. And I'm, I'm not sure that those clubs realise just how much that would actually impact on them. Uh, but having said that, if they are going to allow the AFL players to be playing in the SNFL, and it certainly looks like you know that that's the way it's going to be, then I can't see any logical reason why the Crows need to be the same as Port, you know, why the two models need to be exactly the same. Even the Crows have said they don't mind if there's two different models. So There um, is no logical reason. There, I, there I can't see any logical, logical reason, reason behind it at all. And certainly from the outside looking in, it does appear that there's a bit of pettiness involved there, that, there, that there's you know old wounds, as you said, that have been around for a long time, and people that just aren't willing to move on and move forwards for the betterment of football in general and for the betterment of the game and, and hopefully for the benefit of the SNFL and the AFL clubs in this state, which I think at the end of the day is what we all want. We all want there to be two successful AFL clubs in this state or at least one successful AFL club in this state. <laughs> and, uh, and we all want there to be a strong SNFL competition. I don't think anyone's saying, well, yeah, we really want that competition to die, uh, but we don't want you know, the tail wagging the dog either. You know, there's got to be a compromise here uh, that suits all parties and everyone can move forward and, and you know, get a result that they're happy with. And I think I think that's what we'd all like to see at the end of the day. Yeah, look, I, I do agree with that, and I do agree that uh, probably splitting the club would end up <laughs> fracturing the club even more and, you know, all the confusion would come back. There's pros and cons with each sort of system. I just find it bizarre that the SANFL directors have just openly said, no, Port Adelaide's model just won't work, 100% no, not going to happen. But the Crows model, which, you know, probably affects the SANFL in a more negative fashion, you know, they're, they're happy to bring that in. I don't understand that at all. Yeah, and, and to be honest, having spoken to people previously heavily involved in various different SNFL clubs that aren't put out late, I'm not that surprised at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. oh, when the Saints go marching in, oh, when the Saints go marching in, Okay, so, uh, so, you know, at the Port Adelaide Football Club, we're always looking forwards, looking forward to our next premiership. And so we're going to start looking forwards now, looking forward to our next game, which is going to be against St Kilda. Uh, so, Rick, perhaps you'd like to start with a bit of a preview of what you think we can expect this week against St Kilda. Well, I think, uh, you know, we've got a few issues going on here. I think we're, one of them is uh, we've got a bit of an issue, which we a lot of people are aware of, 
playing Etihad in recent years. Um, and hopefully uh, St Kilda will be a bit more of a uh, more competitive uh, opposition for us to play uh, compared to, say, Essendon a few weeks ago, and we might be able to put up a bit more of a show. I think uh, as we got exposed with the Hawks, with the key position players, and you know, I noticed what you guys pointed out, and I had it down too, we, we were missing the key forward and back. So, you know, maybe St Kilda aren't as strong in that department. You know, obviously they've got... Uh, Nick Rewalt, which is uh, he's still a you know a massive uh, workhorse in their forward line, but uh, you know the rest of the players, other than maybe Ben McAvoy, uh, uh, are not as strong obviously as the Hawthorne side, and so you know there's going to be a good test there for our our young backs on uh, on playing on Rewalt and uh, and uh, Macca's fan for the week, Loby, uh playing against Ben McAvoy, who I thought's been pretty good this year, and. Uh, uh, you know, it's going to be we're losing one of our our engine movers in Kane Corns this year with with one of the leading AFL disposals. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how we replace him, and it's also going to be interesting from my perspective uh, if Westoff comes back and and John Butcher stays in the side. I really hope so. I I really think you know we were exposed against Essendon with being short. Um, maybe another key target, and again, that looked like it for us last week. So, if we can have Westoff, Schultz, and uh, Butcher all playing around the forward 50, I think uh, that's going to make us look a lot more competitive. And uh, and as you guys pointed out, Andrew Moore's been great the last few weeks, and I'm, I'm really interested to see, uh, you know, maybe if he's going to step it up again another level with uh, with Kane being out and, and have more influence again in the midfield. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm really optimistic. I'm bullish about this game. Uh, I think there's no excuses. Uh, we're, we're performing much better this year. And, you know, St Kilda have been competitive but just dropping off. And, and uh, yeah, I, I'm really hoping that we'll turn our form around at this ground. And uh, I'm thinking uh, we should be able to pull out hopefully a five-goal goal win and uh, prove that we deserve to keep our spot in the eight. Awesome. That was great, Rick. Yes, you preempted all the questions I was going to ask you following <laughs> on from that about the game, so you've done it beautifully. So, uh, so Maka, what are your thoughts on the game coming up against the Saints? Danger game. Absolute danger game. Uh, on paper, we should win. Um, I do believe we've got a better side than St Kilda. Um, but this is a game where in the past five or six years we will lose in farcical fashion. Um, they've only won three games for the year. They've been pretty close to winning maybe another three or four games. Um, but I think we can really expose them if we bring in a more traditional um, sort of uh, structure. I'd really like to see us go in with three key forwards and three key defenders plus Lobie. Um As you mentioned earlier, uh, we have played pretty uh, undersized all year. Um, I would like to see that changed um, this week. Um, obviously, I think the keys for St Kilda are obviously Rewalt. Um, he's had a fantastic year. I think he's a Monty for all Australian. Um, Lee Montagna, you know, he's he picks up a lot of the ball. He, he kicks goals. Um, Dylan Robertson, he's someone that doesn't get a lot of press, but he's had a huge year in his first year at St Kilda. Uh, I didn't rate him at all at Frio, but you know, he's come in, he's kind of their defensive general. Um, he's someone that, you know, traditionally we will need to look out for. Um, and I'm going to throw a bit of a curly one in there and say Tom Lee. Um, I'm going to call it the Cleve Hughes rule. Um, you know, in our journey, we've had a lot of unknown key forwards kick a lot of goals on us. Um, Cleve Hughes, Julian Kersner, Kent Kingsley, um, in previous years, I reckon we could just about write down Tom Lee to kick five goals in this one. So I'm, I'm going to throw him, him in there as a bit of a key player um, and someone that we really want to sort of uh, watch. I'd love to see Homsch go to him, actually, if he, if he comes back in. So uh, so in terms of selection, Maker, then who do you think should be coming back in? Sounds well, like Homsch is obviously one of them. Yeah, I, I think Homsch definitely needs to come back in. Westoff's a Monty, obviously. Um, who to replace... Kane Corns. I'd, I'd really like to see Kane Mitchell come back into the side and, and inject a bit of pace. Um, I'd almost like to see him take over Corns' uh, tagging role. I think, you know, with his uh, Porsche's fantastic thing of pace and endurance, um, I think he's someone that could do that role really well and hurt the other way. 
um, if he can sort of win his own ball and, and maybe even snag a couple of goals. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I tend to agree with you, Mac. I think this is a danger game. I think if you look at, you know, earlier in the season, we started really strongly, um, and then we lost a couple of tough ones, and then we sort of fell away a little bit. Like, we didn't rebound back, you know, once we got to some easier teams, you know, and I'm sure you know, people don't mind me saying the Western Bulldogs, you're not travelling brilliantly this year, um, but we let a couple of games slip that we really shouldn't have uh, because I think we just, you know, the young team, they sort of did get down on confidence a little bit. So I do think this is a massive danger game. I think that it's a game we absolutely should win um, and that if we're going to continue the progressions we've been making this year, that it's a really important game for us to win. Uh, but I do think it's a massive danger game. Um, in terms of the selections, yeah, I'm a bit like you. I'd really like to, well, like both of you, I'd like to see a couple more tall guys come in um, I'd, I'd really like to see Westhoff and Homsch both be back into the side. Um, I was thinking, as similar to you, Macker, actually, that I'd really like to see Kane Mitchell come back in in, in Telstra or Etihad Stadium. Uh, but uh, but I just don't think his performance in the SNFL on the weekend it w- was enough to warrant him forcing his way back in. Unfortunately, I think if he'd had a good game, I would have really liked to have seen him back in. Um, in terms of the opposition, I think you know the one guy that I'm really worried about is Stevie Milne. He seems to always. Uh, you know, get up and about for games against us. And he's sort of come back into the team. He's had a lot of turmoil. And I've just got a feeling he's going to have one of those breakout games where he kicks a bag. And, and I hope that's not against us. Um, and so uh, so all in all, I think... Uh, actually, Maka, did I get a tip from you? Uh, who do you think is going to win and by how much? Oh, look, I, I think we'll win. Um, I hope we win. I'm going to say Port by 37 points. Nice. And, and, and Ricky, you had the, the power by five goals, what, by the sound of it. Yeah, that's spot on the money. And, uh, and I'm going to be a bit more ambitious. I reckon that Port's going to come and get up by 65 points. I reckon we should absolutely come in and steamroll them. I hope so. And, uh, be and I hope we do. I'm a bit worried that we won't. But I think that if we play to our best, if we play the way we've been playing throughout the year, I really think that's absolutely possible. So thank you, guys. I, I know we've got our interview coming up now. Um, so we're really excited to have an interview coming up with Darren Burgess that everyone can look forward to. So, so buckle your seats in and, and listen to this fantastic interview Rick Scott with Darren Burgess. I just want to say uh, thanks, Darren, for making the time and coming in. And one of the other things I want to say is a lot of the supporters from the from the big footy aspect are very happy that you've uh, you've come back into the AFL system and especially Port Adelaide. And uh, I just so a lot of us would like to say thanks for that. And I guess it's you've been pretty um, popular in the media so far this year too, with the boys and the fitness and. So, uh, how are you enjoying your transition back to AFL and your passion to come back to Port? Yeah, it's, it's been good. It's, um, it's uh, coming back into Australia is a big thing. Um, yep. for myself, and my family, it's a, it's a massive thing to come back to Oz. Mm. Um, I mean, coming back into the AFL is something that I wanted to do because, from a fitness point of view, the AFL is probably the number one sport in the world to work in. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, if I was coming back to the AFL. My preference is to come back to Port because of the history that I had here and, yeah. and uh, I'm a supporter and, and so, yeah, it's been really good. Mm. Um, the media is something which uh, I try to avoid a little bit, but yeah. um, <laughs> uh, I guess with uh, with myself, Richard and Ken coming in this year, you know, it was uh, the club wanted to make a push um, at the start of the season to yeah. uh, start the pre-season to promote this change afoot, so... Um, I'm happy to be part of that and promote the club whenever whenever we can. It's fortunate so far that it's, it's worked out okay. Yep. Touch wood. Got a few games to go to win yet before we can um, yeah. you know, finish the season. But no, I've really enjoyed it. Love the club and love the place. So you, did you feel like maybe you had a bit of unfinished business from 2007? And... Oh, maybe. Like, uh, I mean, we, we got to the grand final in 07, so you know, I'd like to think that I played some part in that. So yeah. I, I know there's a little bit of... Uh, you walked out on a contract, and I don't like doing that. Um, mm. But I walked out with a club's blessing, and and Choco was was very happy with that. So I don't necessarily feel guilty about mm. about leaving. Mm. Um, but what I did do was uh, I told Choco in October and and stayed around till the end of January yeah. to to help with the transition, which I mm. you know the FFA didn't want me to do. They wanted me up there straight away, but I said no. Mm. I want to make sure Porter in good hands. Um, yeah. So. You know, I felt like I, I, I did okay by Port, even though, yeah. you know, I left when, when we were at the top and, and the next year wasn't such a good one. But, um, mm. um, look, the, the bottom line is I wanted to come back to Adelaide and wanted to come back to Port, so it yeah, worked yeah. out really well. That's excellent, yeah. yeah. No, I guess what I mean I, from unfinished business, I guess, was, you know, Port may almost 
won the grand final. Yeah. We made the grand final, and sometimes people, I think, forget. You know, that's an accomplishment in itself. Yeah, yeah, they're not and, easy to get to, as, as yeah. uh, everybody's finding out. So it was a it was a great year in '07, and, and uh, you know, everything went right for us. And um, yeah, look, I'd mm. love to get back there. Love to yeah. get back there. It'd be great. Yeah. Especially considering where we've been the last few years. Well, the boys are looking good, sure. and hopefully it's not too far away. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think it's a few years, um, a few year plan. So mm. hopefully, uh, at some point down there. Mm. Uh, unfortunately for us, there's a few pretty good teams in Gold Coast and Western Sydney building mm. across that timeline as well. But yeah, yeah. We'll see how we go. I guess one of the things, I guess, if you compare soccer, because I mean, you obviously went to soccer for a while, where the game doesn't really change; it's pretty stagnant with its rules. But you've got. AFL where there's constant rule changes and we've got the interchange cap coming in next year supposedly. I mean there's such a, an evolution of the game and I, you may reference that you know, it's one of the ultimate sports I guess. Is that part of the challenge with the fitness with AFL? Yeah absolutely. It's, um, you're right, soccer has stayed the same and, and, and that has its own attraction and charm I guess. Um, mm. But yeah, um, fortunately or unfortunately the rules keep changing in footy so we have to uh, adapt to it. So mm. definitely the rotation thing is something that I've had to get used to. We were kind of leading the way in 07 with 40 or 50 rotations. And yeah. Now, uh, you know, we, we did on the weekend 139. So, mm. um, yeah, you definitely have to get your head around that. And with the rotation cap, hopefully, you know, that, that'll that come in. Who knows what level that'll come in at. And and then we'll have to re-sort of calibrate again and yeah. and uh, and change our, our training philosophy. But that's something we've had an eye on for a bit. And, you know, um, so you almost got. We think we'll be ready for you, it. You got to look for now and for the, the that's future. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we certainly got one eye on the future and what's happening next yeah. year for sure. And I read one of uh, an article I think from when you just came back, and uh, you made reference to the mental aspect. Uh, for you with the players as well as the the physical aspect, so you really you really try to uh, help the players mentally with their with their confidence and yeah yeah I think that's uh, just as strong if not stronger to have the guys um, excuse me believe yeah. that they're fit and and uh, and work hard on on overcoming um, you know just traditional mental barriers to to performance so. Yeah. You know, most players look at the clock, you know, in the last quarter or the red time within each quarter and go, oh, I can't wait for the break. We, we want the guys to to actually think, no, this is the time where we're going to get an edge. And, yeah. You know, so, yeah, we, we worked on that over the summer for sure. Uh, I guess, I mean, I played sport at a minor level, but it's still the same principle. I mean, exactly. if, if you visualise and yep. you, you have your goals, it, it sort of helps you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One of the um, one of the big footy uh, members uh, was interested to know. Um, you made reference to you know the altitude tra- training and compared it to, to heat training, and and there was a couple of cynics out there going, oh, that's because Port's a poor club and you know can't afford to, to do the altitude. But you know, is that is that something uh, legitimate that you you believe in? Oh, absolutely. Um, if if you think the principle behind altitude training is to to make the body work in a oxygen poor environment, mm. so up high, not, a, not as much oxygen, you make the body work there so that when it does have oxygen, mm. it's more efficient in its use of it. Yeah. So with heat training, it's the same principle because your body sends a whole lot of blood and oxygen to the skin in order to cool it down, so your muscles are actually mm. deprived of oxygen as well. So in, yeah. in really simple terms, you're working under similar conditions. Mm. There's a lot of research that will come out in the next three or four years which support the use of um, heat training mm. with players so um, same rules apply if if you want to altitude train the best time to do it is just before the season certainly not four months before the season starts yeah um, but going to camps in in America and wherever else you might go for altitude have other benefits such as bonding and the mental toughness that, that we spoke about earlier so, yeah 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 um, so that's certainly not to say that they're not useful they certainly are but from a physiological point of view I would prefer heat training over altitude training um, sure. for for this group of players. Yeah. If I was dealing with swimmers or cyclists or something like that, it'd be a, a different story. Yeah. Um, but certainly for this group of players. Okay, it's quite it, it, it's interesting you, you brought up the uh, the cyclists because um, uh, I mean we spoke previously about you know looking at the cycling aspect yep. and. Uh, 
you know, and there's been some people uh, that suggest that there's no real correlation or crossover, but you know, do you feel there's a, a benefit to, to looking at other sports uh, in relation to the fitness and science and, uh, you know, you, there's information that can be gleaned from you and players in relation yeah, to fitness? Yeah, yeah. No, look, 100%, and that's probably something that um, we haven't been great at, as in we as in um, Australians haven't been great at going to other sports, for sure, so... Mm. Um, that's something that, that uh, I've been lucky enough to do, being you know living overseas and, and travelling a bit with the Socceroos. So um, yeah, whether it's the training methods and, and mental toughness of a of a Stuart O'Grady or a, you know a cyclist versus a um, what the NFL do for strength versus the resilience of a English Premier League soccer player, you, you can certainly learn from it. So with it, with in relation to Port and the players. I mean, obviously, Kane Corns is the notable uh, in the media of being a fitness animal. Who's uh, who are the other fitness animals in the club, and who are the players that sometimes you might have to chase a bit with the, around the oval? Uh, look, probably the person uh, who's going to challenge Kane in terms of a running point of view will be Kane Mitchell. He'll be yeah, you know, he, he's an outstanding runner, and and, mm. uh, and Kane Corns is in for a tough battle next preseason in in the three k time trials because Kane Mitchell. K. Mitchell, Stu, uh, Sam Calhoun, Tom Cleary, Ollie Wines, those guys are all elite runners. And yeah. um, so uh, I'm excited to see how they're going to go with another couple of pre-seasons under their belt. Yeah. Um, uh, who do I have to chase around? Uh, honestly, the, the group this year is outstanding yeah. compared to what they tell me over the last few years, the people that you have to chase around. Yeah. Um, uh, there really is nobody there. They're all... They all they last pre-season, embrace pre-season mm. really well. They look hungry. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And I think I think um, some of the things they've been saying in the media, it's not, not a lie, it's not bullshit. They're, mm. they're actually sick of being irrelevant. And so they know that in order to to perform well in the season, you have to do a good pre-season. So this yeah. pre-season, for anybody who watched any of the sessions, they would have seen the guys working really hard. Yeah, so yeah. So I, I certainly couldn't name anybody mm. that, that really hated any aspects of... Mm. Um, or, or that I had to really say, no, 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 you have to do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, they've been good. No, well, I think you can see it on the in the in the results and how they're tracking too. Yeah, let's hope it continues. Fingers crossed. Yeah, with absolutely. Hawthorne this week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the uh, the big footy members wanted to know. I guess it's probably a, um, a correlation with the with the interchange cap. Um, is it hard to qualify, but is there the balance between muscle mass to aerobic fitness and, and has that changed since you were last at Port Adelaide and, uh, and you're looking at and in relation to interchange caps? Uh, yeah, I think, I think it actually changed when I was away yeah. and it became um, the, the coaches wanted, a, wanted bigger players, mm. um, but now it's going back. Uh, mm. Because the interchange cap will come in, whether that's 80, 100, 120, you know, nobody knows. But the mm. fact that they're going to cap it means that players will have to run more and have to be on the. Yep. No job. Yeah, someone someone tried to... calling. <laughs> no, that's right. You're just yeah. not able to carry that muscle mass. So yeah. I think I think you'll find that, that it goes back to slightly leaner players. So it's going to be more aerobic based. I think so, yeah. 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 You that, have... That's what we think it'll be. You obviously have maybe the odd Hulk at either end, which yeah, doesn't of have course. to. And then... Yeah, yeah, of course. But even they, those guys now, like. If you look at some of the distances that someone like Schultz covers, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. So yeah. um, they certainly have to be aerobically fit. And I think that Justin Westhoff was another example early in the season. They were saying what he was getting up to 16, 17 k's yeah, a game. Yeah, he he's, he certainly can run. Yeah. Uh, but it, excuse me, someone like Bobby is is up around 13 kilometers in a game. So yeah, it's amazing. You know, isn't they have it? to work pretty hard. And I guess the other emphasis has been on uh, on core training. So, you know, how big an emphasis is that now? Is you know, is that is that to complement running? Because I'm assuming running probably doesn't develop the core as much. Or is no, it... you, you're right. Um, the, the core stuff, and, and I guess by core you mean not just abs, but the hips mm. and pelvis and back. Mm. You know, that, that that's the main part of what we do um, mm. in the gym. We've got an outstanding gym coach in, in Ian McCowan and. And um, Andrew Rondinelli and Jared Egan help out as well in that, in those areas, and yeah, um, yeah their, their focus is on player movement and player injury injury prevention, and, and the main focus of that is on that, that central area of the body. So yeah, we absolutely focus on that. Yeah, if yeah. you went and saw a gym session, it wouldn't be typical mm. bicep curls and bench presses. You know, they're, mm. they're a thing of the past. We, we mm. certainly look at the more central aspect of the body for sure. I actually noticed with um, Sydney last 
when we played them, and uh, you could almost see a transformation with, with Kurt Tippett as well. Just the the real strength he had in the yep. the upper upper stomach region there, yeah, yeah. and uh, you could almost see the the body shape sort of evolving in in the AFL Absolutely. player. And, and you know, big hips, big bum, big core. That's that's what you want. Yeah, because um, that'll. that'll protect you from injury and enable you to, to sort of explode on the field. So. Yeah, added strength. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how much harder will next pre-season be and um, will there be a balance of uh, aerobic to muscle development? Yeah, it, it's... Uh, next pre-season will certainly be harder. Um, even though this pre-season was pretty hard, we knew we had a fairly young group, in fact the third youngest in the league, so mm. we couldn't push them as much as I could say the 2007 group who were, you know, a pretty robust sort of group. So yeah. now that they've had that pre-season head, we can, we can certainly take it to another level. And, and they'll, as always, there'll be a, a mix of endurance and strength. Mm. Um, uh, so that, that won't change, that balance won't change in pre-season. It'll just be that we, we bump everything up by 15 20%. And yep. players know that. I've already warned them. So... Um, yeah, they, they know what they're in for. but More, uh, more like, heat training. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. You know, uh, like like last year, I'm sure they'll embrace it. And, yeah. You know, they'll, they'll take to it because they've seen the benefits that that, that sort of training and the, the extra skill work and stuff that we, we let them do yeah. um, has given them this year. Excellent. Yeah. I just want to say uh, thanks for giving up some of your time. Yeah, I know no you're, you're pretty busy and... Uh, uh, you know, it's great that you've helped support the the, the podcast for the, you know the big footy community, and uh, oh, you know we, we'll all be watching uh, how it goes over the over the next year. Yeah, no appreciate worries. your time. Excellent. Cheers, Rick. Thanks, Darren. All right, so fantastic interview, Rick. That was just brilliant. There was some really good insights there. So uh, so well done for that, mate. Um, I really want to say a big thank you to the Port Adelaide Football Club. You know, the support they've given us to do these podcasts has been fantastic. Um, they really, as far as we're aware, the only club really interacting with these big footy uh, AFL podcasts, which is fantastic. And, and to be able to get someone like Darren Burgess available for a first up interview for a brand new podcast that was actually just doing our first ever show, um, it's a real credit to the Port Adelaide Football Club, the way they engage with their fans, dare I say to SNFL, the way they engage with their community, uh, which is fantastic. So we really want to give a massive thank you to Port Adelaide and a massive thank you to Darren Burgess. Um, this is, of course, going to be a weekly podcast. This is the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast. Uh, it's going to be available on iTunes. It's going to be available on YouTube. Uh, there'll be a thread for it on the Port Adelaide thread on Big Footy, so you'll be able to find us all over the place. Um, so thank you, Rick. Thank you, Macca. Cheers, guys. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, it was a great first episode, and we look forward to bringing you many more. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Catch you later. Goal here because we're 29 minutes gone, and the breeze is going left to right. This Always is one out. of the toughest kicks ever. And he's a long way out. He hits it, oh, what a and he's kicked it, I think. Hodges kicks it. I don't believe it. Port Adelaide, you are miracle workers. That is unbelievable. What Sean Hodges has is... kicked it. Unbelievable. What a player. That is one of the most difficult shots for goal you could ever imagine. The breeze is going strongly from left to right. He's had to thread that through the eye of a needle.